Yes, sir. Okay. Are you are you able to see my presentation? Yeah. Yes. Fine. All right, everyone. Thanks for uh, sharing your time in this today's afternoon. And uh, the theme of this session is around IoT and its use cases. And as uh, Priyanka just introduced me. Uh, what she did uh, probably mention is I spent about 12 years in uh, this company called Cisco, where I was the CTO for the service provider team in India and SAP. So that is uh, where my journey of IoT actually began way back in 2000. And uh, when we used to talk about IoT then, it was something which we people thought about, like you're talking science fiction that time. So today we are in the age where all of you guys are exposed to a lot of tools, a lot of devices around you, and you are probably seeing some of the applications. But back then, of course, people would think that we're just talking some science fiction. So let me just uh, move ahead. The agenda for today's session is uh, we'll just do a short introduction to IoT, jump into some of the industry verticals and see what are the use cases uh, worldwide which people are looking at IoT specifically for. We'll look at the use cases in India, and we'll talk about the innovative Indian companies who have really made some uh, great progress in this particular area and how public cloud We lost your voice. Hi, we are not able to hear you. Okay, I think somebody had muted me. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, not sure where did you guys lose me? Uh, was it yes, uh, we can. at the start of the slide itself or? Uh, yes, I believe at the start of the slide itself. While okay, you good. using yourself, yeah. All right. So, uh, okay. So just a little bit again about my introduction. I One of the uh, majority of my career I was spent at this company called Cisco where I was the CTO for the service provider team in Indian SAR, and I was also one of the architects in the PJC region. Uh, so that is where I used to speak a lot about IoT and what IoT can do. Uh, right from the year 2000, we used to actually talk about IoT. The IoT, unfortunately, that time, as I said, was a thought of a science fiction. The good thing is today, you guys probably use a lot of those fitness trackers. So a lot of you are already exposed to IoT. And a lot of what I will be talking will make sense. So the agenda for today is we'll quickly look at the introduction of IoT. We'll talk about where IoT gets utilized in the industry verticals. And then we'll talk about India, specifically in India, what are the use cases? Uh, what are the innovative Indian companies? We'll talk about how public cloud has moved IoT from a hype to a reality. And finally, of course, uh, like any technology, IoT also has its own challenges. Uh, I'll just highlight two of those here, which is around privacy and security. And finally, if we are left with some time, we'll definitely get into some Q&A. Uh, how does that sound? So can I get a, could you guys hear me on this? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. So starting with what is yes, IoT? So, so essentially you're looking at a network. So Internet of Things, essentially it's a network, right? Which connects physical and virtual objects, which can talk to each other, or they're talking to some, some central server by which they can share some information or take some action. Uh, an action could be simply something like an on-off, like you want to switch off your smart light, or you want to switch off something, or maybe some complex actions where you probably want to give a uh, huge amount of dashboard or some information to people by which they can take some action. On the right side, what you're seeing is those sensors, which are the things which capture the information and 
relay it over the network and you are essentially making sense out of it so iot is not something which is new i mean uh, it prior to the term even being coined while it was being coined in 1999 by kevin ashton who was the executive director of the mit auto labs when he was delivering the presentation to proctor and gamble on the supply chain management and uh, while he was looking at uh, some excitement to be created with the customer he coined this term called internet of things but of course he looked at rfid as the prerequisite so he thought that anything which is connected to rfid is internet of things so that is way back in 1999 again just to again share what really was one of the birth points of iot was this coke machine which uh, was connected to the arpanet so prior to the internet what we hear today uh, the common term where you are interconnecting multiple networks it was a public network by the us uh, uh, defense advanced research projects agency so darpa and it was called as darpanet before they removed the defense out of it it became arpanet and arpanet today is what we call it as the internet so the carnegie mellon university students uh the three of these students who would have to who, who used to like coke so they would like to know that okay is there coke available in the dispenser and why they wanted this was because the coke machine was located very far away from where their classrooms or where their uh, work was being done so they just wanted like is there coke right in that machine that is the problem they were trying to solve and that was the first iot device way back in 1980s so essentially what you are looking at is uh, it's those sensors uh, talking to the gateways pushing information to a computer and the computer processing some output so if you look at the air, airplane itself so the sensors are position height speed maybe temperature location all these various sensors which get fed on to the onboard on the flight itself and the output comes as okay your engine is probably rotating too fast you can make it slow or maybe the flaps can be changed because you're trying to land or you're trying to take off uh, and maybe something to do with the motor so that is the output you are essentially looking at so iot first day i think uh, can somebody uh, i can hear some noise can you just go on mute please yokesh uh, i this uh, your uh, presentation is not moving i think it is freezed oh is it presentation is not moving the slides are not moving okay so can you see my slide now no it's actually not freeze there is no movement Can you see my slide now? Yes. All right. So, uh, were you able to see this slide in the previous slide, or in the previous slide you could not see? No, we can't see any slide earlier. So, we... so could you see the slide? Are you able to see a slide right now? Yes, we can see now. Okay. So, this is what I was talking about: the IoT and the sensors. so on the right side you are saying couple of uh, examples of some sensors which capture the information and this information is delivered to the computers and this is where i talked about kevin ashton and his uh, rfid so are you able to see this part as well are you able to see this part manish kenka yes 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 okay all right yes, so i was talking about, okay. so i was talking about the connected coca cola machine at the carnegie mellon university and the problem they were trying to solve and of course the sensors on the plane which allow it to make the changes so now this is specific to the plane but uh, similar to that you have sensors which are already installed in the buildings
So there are sensors in buildings, sensors in cities which relay information. So if you look at your electricity meters today, they have sensors by which uh, somebody who goes and takes the reading from the electricity meters no longer has to go into each and every meter and take the reading. So they go just position their readers and the readers are able to connect to all the sensors in each of those individual meters and collect the information so that person can deliver this information or it can be directly related from that particular device via the internet onto a central machine or a central cloud by where you are performing some analytics on top of it. I mean, in case of your electricity meter, it could be as simple as generating your consumption bill. But IoT today has many applications and we'll be talking about some of those applications. So in this slide, I'm talking about the IoT architecture and I'm looking at a very simplified architecture. Uh, the sensors which you saw on the first slide, not all of them uh, are ready for IoT. Not all the sensors today are ready for IoT. In which case they are called as constraint capable, capable IoT, where they have to connect to a hub which transforms their connectivity over to the IP network, which is the internet protocol network, and is able to deliver this to the cloud or to any server which you want, where you perform the data analytics, you perform any of the business intelligence on top of it and deliver it to the end user. So in this example, the end user is sitting on a smartphone and getting some information from the network. The other type of sensor is a full capability sensor where the sensor itself has got the IP capability right out of that particular device. So if you see the smart cameras, you see the smart uh, traffic signals today, those have the IP capability right in the device itself. So that is where the two different type of devices which you're looking at. And essentially below here, you are looking at the hub for connecting your constraint capability network or the full capability IoT can directly connect to the internet cloud. It can also connect via hub, not that it can't. The hub of course- Sir, will you speak a little loudly? Is everybody facing the same issue or only her? Priyanka, Manish? No, we are we are not facing this issue. It's loud and clear. Okay, so madam, maybe you need to turn on the volume on your device. All right, moving on to the framework now. So we saw the architecture. Now let's look at the framework. Uh, so at the bottom are the things which collect all the information, uh, talk via the gateway to the internet. Now the gateway, when they are talking to the gateway, Today, you have many technologies which connect the IoT devices onto the gateway. So they could be wired or they could be wireless. So wired, of course, today, when you are looking at it, they could be your traditional backnet networks or they could be your, your new world uh, or the actual ethernet networks which connect your normal users, right? So that is, those are the two kinds of networks which typically look at, are looked at from a wired perspective. But majority of the connectivity for the things to the gateway is happening via wireless. So you're looking at something like the Zigbee, you're looking at six low pan, you're looking at an RFID, you're looking at a near field communications, any of these mechanisms. And of course there's Wi-Fi, there is uh, your cellular, there are many such mechanisms which connect your things to the gateway. The gateway further can connect to the internet via again, Wi-Fi, mobile, DSL or fiber. And at the top, you have the services layer. Now the services is typically, if you are from a, u a user, if you own any of those fitness uh, applications, right, which run on your smartphone, that is your service. And at the bottom, which is the thing, the thing which you're wearing on your hand, right? So that is what we are talking about. So to connect to that thing, to the service, you have that intermediate layers of the gateway and the internet. So that is that forms the IoT structure. On the right side of the slide, if you focus, there are the IoT technologies. So a couple of them which I've already talked about, the LAN, the low power wireless, and the RFID, and the gateway functions which connect via the WAN, which is the wired and the wireless. And the internet itself has got the application, the sub-applications which feed the main application. So you're looking at a business process management, maybe analytics, maybe doing OSS, BSS. So if you, let's say, subscribe to a particular fitness service where you have a fitness tracker and then you subscribe to some uh, uh, 
maybe any of those uh, fitness applications like kyle.fit or maybe uh, any of the paid apps now they keep this information saying that okay you have subscribed to so many exercises now which is available on your device as well as you are now capable of seeing that on your phone so that is where that particular iot management services layer comes in so those are the iot technologies now i wanted to further move into the wireless connectivity op options which we saw uh there with the stream of uh, there you will see a lot of names here right from bluetooth all the way to lora all the way to nbiot so i don't know if you guys heard the latest geo agm where uh, mr amani talked about nbiot being the mechanism by which he is planning to get iot connections into this country so that's where he is trying to make the geo network as one of the largest iot hubs for a lot of the devices but essentially if you look at it how do you decide what technology is right for you so it depends on how much is the distance between that particular device to the application so on the extreme left if you see you have the nfc and the emv which is like sub 10 cm this is more proximity so you can actually touch those devices or keep them within that 10 cm distance and then they can talk to each other when you're looking at between 10 cm to 5 km there's a plethora of technologies which are there so again they have their own acronyms so wireless pan wireless han wireless fan wireless lan and wireless nan right so pan stands for personal area network the han stands for home area network the fan stands for the factory area network lan of course you guys are aware of wifi right so that's your wireless lan and finally you have your wireless neighborhood area network so those are the terms again these are not precise terms as the slide says these are typically what the industry uses when they talk about the technologies below so if you're talking about the wireless pan you're essentially talking about usually bluetooth uh when you're talking about wireless han you're talking about something like a zigbee or maybe a z wave if you're talking about the wireless pan you're talking about the ice the six low pan if you're talking about wireless lan you're talking about the 802.11 standards and of course the wireless nan which is your zigbee nan or your wireless m bus so these are focused within that 10 cm to 5 cm 5 km radius by which you can connect your sensors back into your network on the long range which is between 5 km to about 100 km you are essentially seeing cellular obviously that is the technology where you are looking at the 3g pp which currently we are using is the lte and of course 5g is just around so those will be the technologies which will be used to connect all your sensors back into the network or you have the nbiot which is your wireless which is again licensed so these are the two licensed band which means these guys have to pay the government for the spectrum and then of course you have the long range which is the wireless access which is unlicensed something like the sigfox or lora right so these are the two common uh, examples which you will hear which allow you for the long range connectivity so if you have let's say a field and typically this is uh, if you are going to war right uh, or if you are trying to find something in a desert then you are typically placing sensors at a very very long distance and you expect these sensors to report to a hub point which is located very very far so lora is a technology long range or lora which is which is used to deliver this information and each of the sensors are typically uh, they, their job is very simplified as in they might be reporting about humidity they might be reporting about temperature but they will be typically reporting only the changes as they happen so let's say if you are sitting in a desert and the temperature today is 45 degrees and tomorrow also it is 45 degrees there is nothing for the sensor to report but let's say the temperature goes from 45 to 46 or maybe 45 to 40 it comes down that's something which has to be reported so only that time the communication really happens and the battery life is something which is very important when you are looking at wireless connectivity options so the battery battery life in the sensors which are located in the field or they are located far away where uh, they are they can't be powered right otherwise you are looking at technologies which are connected to your wireless lan or your battery networks so these are usually connected over wired 
networks and the power source for these device is the uh, electricity itself so if you're looking at cameras which are capturing your information or there are those uh, fire sensors these are usually wired in there they don't have batteries but as you go in the field you're looking at more of the battery usage and you're trying to conserve the battery so that the typical sensor replacement time you're not looking at more than like four to ten years that will be time range which you would li literally go and maybe remove a sensor and replace the battery or maybe replace the sensors now that we have seen the connectivity aspect of iot uh, let's jump into okay we understood what and how right what is iot we understood a little bit about how iot is really uh, i mean how the connectivity really works let's talk about the use cases and this is where the maximum energy maximum time people really spend is trying to tell you okay what iot can really do for you so in this slide there are about 10 areas which we are talking about right from vehicle asset tracking uh, going on to agriculture automation looking at how do we manage the energy consumption obviously security and surveillance so you which is now more prevalent right so when you're looking at traffic management or if you're looking at maybe within your buildings itself or within your neighborhood you might see a lot of security cameras and uh, surveillance mechanisms being built in building management is one of the key areas where iot is shining big time and uh, if you enter a lift if you enter a lift right so even the lift management your electricity management your water management is now being done by iot I can hear some background noise. Uh, Manish, Priyanka, can you just manage that? Thank you. Telemedicine tel and healthcare. So you might have seen the uh, doctor sitting in Italy performing a remote surgery somewhere else in the world, right? And how are they doing? There's no doctor who's actually performing the surgery in the other, in the other part of the world. Essentially, those are the robotic arms and the doctor sitting very far away using the augmented reality and the Internet of Things is managing that particular operation. You're looking at smart homes and cities. You're looking at typically everyday things which you're using. Even today, there are key finders which connect to the Internet. So you can see that on your smartphone saying, OK, where is my key? Okay. Or maybe where is my locker? So people in using gyms, uh, in some other countries, they are now looking at opening their lockers from their smartphones itself. That is the power of IoT. And of course, the M2M is some is a term which was used uh, typically when your machines are talking to machines itself. And finally, the embedded mobile itself. So those are a couple of areas of IoT where we are seeing the applications growing. So Deloitte and Gartner, Technavi, and Arc Advisory Group, all these guys, they are talking about how big IoT is going to become from here. You are essentially looking at almost like a 350 billion worth of opportunity by 2020. So that is about next year. And India is going to drive about 5% of this business. There's a huge amount of push by the government of India, as well as the entire industry to push IoT. In fact, NASCOM, Center of Excellence has come with their own uh, startup uh, umbrella, which where they allow the IoT startups to come, utilize their premise, utilize their tools, utilize their, their IoT devices to create newer and newer applications. So currently that is located in Bangalore, but what I heard is that they're trying to come to Pune and other areas, but that's, that's telling you that there's a lot happening in the IoT world. And if you look at out of that, 350 billion, roughly 262 itself is coming from the software capabilities and service and analytics. The hardware is contributing to about 31 billion and the communication network in about 17 and the computing and the storage to around 18. So there's a lot of money which is being currently put on the table when you're looking at getting the analytics out of the IoT. What they are looking at is breaking up the IoT into two parts. One is focused on the industrial aspect, one is focused on the consumer aspect. So the industrial aspect they're saying is why we are doing it, we are trying to drive the business value. 
on the consumer aspect, they are saying it could be a, a, of anything of personal interest, maybe a health monitoring, maybe a fitness monitoring, or maybe home automation. So people are just trying to come out with the application. So this is an area which is currently very small, but it's growing big time. And in the industrial automation, you are essentially looking at retail, connected vehicles, smart cities, and industrial automation. Here is an example of how connected transportation is driving the industry. Uh, so on the left side, if you see, there is a truck which is carrying the goods. Now, you can use the asset tracking, which could be the sensors located on something which is going inside the truck or maybe the truck itself. So you want to monitor the truck movement, you are looking at the GPS movement. So there is an asset tracking utility which tells you exactly where that vehicle is. So if you have ever bought anything on Amazon or Flipkart or any of these uh, retailers, these guys do their asset tracking. So they know at any point in time where your actual, uh, where your package is located, right? So Blue Dart and all the couriers have been doing this for a very long time, except that they would then be doing this over, the, over their own proprietary networks. More and more, these companies are now opening to the idea of connecting all their assets to the internet so that as an end user, you can check out where exactly your package is. So from a cargo perspective, if they are shipping something which is something which can be damaged, so if there are some groceries or there are some cold storage items which are being delivered, the temperature of that can be delivered via the IoT, maybe onto the truck itself, so the truck driver can see what's going wrong, or they can be delivered to a central point so that they can inform the truck driver that probably the cooling system in your truck is going bad, so you need to fix it up quickly. The fuel level and efficiency for the truck, the geolocation which we talked about, the vehicle speed, driving, and the idle time. So that tells you how we can drive the efficiency. Looking at the engine diagnostics itself, so that the manufacturer of the truck or the your service center can find out that okay, they can predict that okay, what's going wrong and call you in for a scheduled maintenance or maybe a immediate maintenance based on what will be. Uh, report. On the right side, you're looking at how the railway networks. On the right side, you are essentially looking at how the railway networks are connected to each other and what are the areas where I don't know if you guys can see this below on the slide. So this passenger information, we're talking about emergency telephony, we're talking about the video surveillance, we're talking about the passenger announcements, the passenger. Wi-Fi, all the ticketing, all these are the applications which are being enabled by IoT. So there are those networks which the railways are building for themselves and they're utilizing this to deliver the information about your freight or maybe about your passengers to the central command center and from there it can be made available to the end user. Of course, connected transportation cannot be complete without talking about the driverless or the autonomous cars. So when you're looking at the autonomous cars, people are saying, okay, when will this happen? When will I be capable of going without a driver, right? So you can actually, this shows the five points by which you start calling your car to pick you up all the way to getting dropped off and the car going and parking itself. So the autonomous cars are today enabled by the various sensors which are hooked all over the car. And of course, it has got a huge amount of onboard computing by which it is able to calculate. So if you look at the number three year, where if you're traveling in traffic, you are finding how far are you from the car ahead and how far is the car behind you, right? Based on that, they are adjusting the speed as well as the lane which they are driving in. So that is about autonomous cars. Today, this industry has grown very big, so you might be only looking at this ride sharing companies, which is the Uber and the Lyft, or maybe Ola in our country, or Zipcars, right? So that is what we essentially look at. But there are a lot of companies which are really behind making this connected vehicle uh, work. Of course, in infotainment applications and the interface. So if you use the Apple or the Google, uh, you use their uh, consoles in your car or the 
any of the connected infotainment systems which allows you to listen to your favorite music so you get the same experience as you are seeing on your mobile right so that is one of the industries which is driving the car and car industry big time the vehicle diagnostics this is an area which is growing ahead companies like honda companies like toyota they are investing in a lot of these vehicle diagnostics so that the number of recalls of their cars and of course they can take care of predictive maintenance so that they have that additional revenue so they are not just dependent on selling your car they are also getting money from managing your car so the entire ecosystem itself if you see has grown coming to the financial sector so the banking and the financial sector you are looking at automation already being there so the time you hit the atm and you go and remove your money out the atm itself is talking to a central server and based on that server, central server just one the atm is dispensing that machine so that's a classic example of a thing talking to your application and the application telling okay go ahead and dispense the money right on the left hand side if you see there are more applications which are coming out with bvsi so you are now a lot of people are talking about do i really need to carry my cell phone to make a transaction i have my fitness watch can i pay for the grocery with my connected watch so that is the scenario one the second scenario is okay if your car is already connected why can't your car connect to your financial system so that as soon as you go you fill the fuel and your connected car says fine now the fuel is filled now i am ready to pay that is what iot is Uh, IoT is doing in the BFSI segment. Of course, there are a lot more applications. I'm just talking about a couple of them here. The insurance companies have taken IoT even ahead than the banking and the financial companies. You are looking at essentially the connected car, which by the apps can deliver a lot more information. So it can tell that okay, maybe my tires are under uh, filled, so I need to probably you know fill the tire or there's a puncture. so what the insurer can do can they can find that you are at a certain risk threshold maybe you are running your car uh, at a speed of 140 constantly or probably you are engaging the wrong gears so based on that now they can increase or decrease your insurer insurance so if you are a good driver your insurance can come down or if you are a bad driver your insurance can go up similarly on the variables you are wearing the fitness trackers and the smartphone sensors now the variables itself can deliver this information to maybe your doctor uh, to your healthcare insurer so maybe an icsa lombard or hdfc life they could typically come and tell you okay your health is in a good condition so maybe we'll give you a discount on your health insurance or maybe we are seeing that there is something wrong here your smartphone and your they are telling me something is going wrong so you probably go and get it yourself checked and based on your check we will probably advise you the for the course of action on our insurance and of course they can tie up with the hospitals to give your true end to end service on the home front you are essentially looking at maybe cameras you're looking at your home automation systems which allows you to find whether somebody's broken into your home uh, any smoke which is happening any water so which can leak uh, your leaks or floods which can happen and by this your home insurance now this is an area where i understand in india we don't spend money for the home insurance but internationally home insurance is something which is a mandatory thing and slowly india is catching up on this so if you make a call that tomorrow you had something and somebody stole something if it was insured then you could have got this money back similarly if your house was damaged because of any smoke or water then you can even get compensated with that so the home insurance is becoming a very very important thing here and with the connected home application your insurer can now get more information get more insights into you and your house so that they can reduce increase your insurance or maybe offer you your payments on time so that you don't have to keep on following up with them saying okay this is what happened in the house going on to iot in retail so uh, if people would have visited the shopper stop right you might have seen that particular screen by which you just take the new dress and show it in front of the screen and it tells you how you will look in that particular dress right so that is one example of using iot in retail on the left side of this slide you are seeing the amazon go 
by which you just enter the amazon store there is no person there to help you to find your stuff you go pick up your groceries and when you walk out of the gates automatically your credit card will get filled similarly on the right side you are seeing shelfex which is a company which has enabled the shelf technology so you pick up anything from that shelf you automatically get filled right at that particular point so once you place it back it goes off so you can actually see this when you ever visit uh, the united states there are a couple of stores which are already doing this india i believe couple of stores are already trialing this out uh, again it remains to be seen uh, given that our population how this will really work there are some more uh, applications of iot in the retail so when you look at supermarkets when supermarkets have got a lot of refrigeration units so these are the sensors and based on that they can have the predictive maintenance being done saying that you know what uh, currently there is a problem with the particular refrigeration system so you are not only losing the goods but you are also paying a lot for the power consumption so by addressing this issue maybe it can automatically contact the uh, predictive equipment the equipment maintenance company who can come and do the maintenance for you on the logistic side we already talked about how the transportation tracking and the route optimization works so gps has been used to track and along with the higher iot you are essentially looking at more uh, better accuracy so how close you can actually specify that okay if you were taking this route you had to go to five different stores to deliver a particular good now you, the trucker may want may have a certain path by which it may go to the end store first and come all the way back but if there's a pallet which is probably you know the placed in a certain order and it can be delivered to the store which is the near one rather than you know going all the way and delivering everything and then arranging the pallets rearranging the pallets you could drop that particular pallet at that particular store itself so that's the logistics example similarly connected consumer and the customer experience these are the two areas where a lot of uh, effort is going on where iot and analytics are being used together to find okay if you are entering a mall it can actually use your video uh, you, you can use the video or wifi to find out okay how many customers are there in a certain area so let's say you are uh, probably standing maybe next to uh, tata chroma or if you are near godrej store or maybe you are near central or any of these stores right it can then help deliver the uh, those guys deliver messages to your phone which could be a discount coupon or it can tell you what is the latest in their particular stores so that is an example of how iot is currently getting utilized in the retail segment we talked about the consumer iot so consumer iot now you can just look at this slide i mean virtually we'll have everything which is smart over the next couple of years so smart shirt which basically tells you how your heart rate and your respiration is going along maybe there is a, a smart pant or there is a smart socks or even smart shoes so the smart shoes can tell you how many kilometers have been done uh, so how many kilometers have you done how many kilometers have you run etc or how good your shoes are left where are they probably you know how where is the wear and tear which is going on smart glasses which you have already seen so there is the google glass which we have already seen you are looking at the microsoft hololens so lot of these applications are all already around us smart watch of course is the one which is the most common one which we use but the bluetooth tea tracker the smart belts maybe the smart bracelet lot of applications are coming around the consumer iot and people are actually now making business around it so maybe child child protection could be one of the business areas or maybe getting those runners coming together saying that okay these this particular smart shoes uh or the these particular smart shoes wearers can directly get information about the other smart shoe wearers and compete against them virtually okay so they may not be there in the same race but they could potentially compete virtually so or any any kind of application this application is something which the end user or the developer can think about and they just have to find the right market to take this and make it a success let's talk about the india iot use cases and some of the innovative indian companies 
Now in India, of course, smart cities. Uh, there's a big buzz which is going around, and Altizon is one of the companies which uh, was contracted by the government to create a solution which would monitor the power and the water levels. So the Altizon has got some power meters which basically show you the power consumption, and they also have the smart water meter which allows you to measure the consumption, and also identifies if there is any leakage. Or any problems with your water, so that's coming from a smart energy management perspective. On the inventory and the supply chain optimization, there's a company called Connectem, which uh, essentially looks at how can they reduce and how can they find out how much of raw material is being consumed in the industry process. So in the manufacturing process, how much of raw material are you really using? So the remote management system. Which they deployed for this particular company allowed them to view the entire raw material consumed and was capable of telling them that this is where the wastage lied, or this is where they can actually provision the entire supply chain. So the order ahead, otherwise what would happen is they would order excess and keep at times, or they because sometimes you realize that you got too much of stuff, they would order less, and that is the time they would need more. So the supply chain was completely optimized by this particular company. On the right side, what you are looking at is those three areas of industrial internet, the embedded computing, and some niche solutions. So on the top, we already talked about the industrial internet, which is the left two examples. And on the embedded computing, you have the, these companies, Altiox, Ovis, or Inida, which are working in the areas of Embedded security or the wireless embedded computing, and the niche solution, Healthify, Cult Dot Fit, Get Active. Many of these guys are focusing on healthcare, looking at retail, and some of them are also focused on the security aspect. So while IoT has its use cases, the Indian Cops are also becoming smarter. The traffic cops have got the the traffic management systems using the internet. And today uh, in Mumbai, we just heard that they are going to deploy about 789 crores worth of this use case. So, what is what are they essentially trying to do? They are trying to find that is there a system which can help us to find check the stop line violation, right? Now, many of us. See that there is that big white line, which essentially is the stop line. So we are supposed to stop before that, but a lot of them actually go ahead of that line and they actually stop on the zebra. So that is one area where they want to find that who are the people who are violating this. The second is of course people continuing in a certain lane and speed violation detection. So if you have traveled on any of the expressways which are there between the cities. You may have seen that if you go beyond a certain speed limit, your information is being currently tracked by manual radars. So there are those traffic police standing with the radar, which is pointing to your device, pointing to the vehicle, and each vehicle is being manually captured, and their information is being stored locally there, and then they go and upload it. But with IoT, they want this information to be immediately uploaded to a central system by which they can find out. What the traffic violators and the challans can be immediately issued. Uh, similarly, the traffic signal should be adapted, which means if there is no traffic in a certain area, uh, maybe you want that to be constantly green. Versus if there is a traffic in a certain area, you want to manage the four lanes or the crossroads accordingly. That is the system which they are trying to build, and of course the objectives. For each of those are listed here, which I will let you read. Or once this presentation is available to you, so you can read what exactly they are trying to look at. But essentially, the traffic management and parking is those are the two key areas where they are trying to solve the problem. Tata Communication in their uh, in the Tata Steel area of Jamshedpur is planning to do about fifteen thousand smart street lights, which can be controlled and operated through the internet. That is. Happening from an industry perspective, the country itself has got a mandate to roll out all the smart meters because the utilities today are losing a lot of money, and uh, 
manually getting all the information, not getting the right information in time, is costing them a lot. So they are trying to get smart smart meters almost everywhere in the country. Mintra, which is one of the online e-commerce uh, companies, they they have bought this company called Witworks, which is a smart wearable. Okay, and utilizing this wearable, they are planning to uh, throw a lot of these smart smart clothes at you. That is something which they are planning to do. And of course, the Pune city has done something which is very innovative, where they have gone a couple of uh, steps ahead. And they have, apart from the traffic lights, they are also looking at the toilet board pollution to find where are the public toilets located in the city. And also, what is their current condition? Are they in a good condition? Can they be used? And when does it require the sewage to be treated or any disease which is, which could be possible because of a certain uh, toilet, right? So they are capturing all that information and creating this uh, and delivering it to the public over a app. Fussel.io. This company essentially has got this uh, IoT device, which you can see on the right side, which is solar powered which allows the farmers to capture the information of their field to the fossil cloud platform and analyze it there. Once they analyze it, they are able to predict that based on what is the weather out there, what is the temperature out there, what is the condition out there, what would be the most rewarding crop they can grow, right? So that is the predictability they can do. And then they give this information to the farmer. Now the farmer can now Find out okay based on this particular weather i know that probably it is going to rain in the next couple of days uh, so maybe i don't need to water my fields so much the way i'm doing it right now or maybe there are no rains going to be there so i need to invest in so the farmer can then decide what kind of crops to grow and profit from that so that is fussel.io for you. Now, in India, of course, all of us are cricket crazy fans. So two applications, see how, see how.com. They've got a smart ball. And if you see here on the left side, you can see the smart ball, which is powered. And they using this smart ball, it has got many sensors, which finds, okay, when you're bowling, what is the speed? What is the spin? What is the seam position? And using this, they deliver to their particular app and using that particular app, the bowler can then find out, okay, how can they improvise their bowling? What can they do better in these in their areas? On the right side, you have Mr. Chappell, who is talking about this company called Straight Bat. Okay, and I'll play this video for you guys. No voice is not coming as yes, as the video is not you know. Okay, uh, you are not able to hear the video. Yeah. Oh, it is not. Okay. Yeah. Are you able to see the video now? No. <laughs> Okay, maybe I, I, I can talk about this one. Uh, essentially, Greg Chappell is talking about the straight bat and he's talking about the what the straight bat can do. So there are those sensors which are connected behind the bat, which allows you to find when you are moving the when you're moving the bat, where are the possible areas where your ball can be hit, what is the back lift angle, what is the impact speed, the swing speed, blah blah. So there are many such uh, so here is where I, I don't know. Can you see this particular slide uh, part of the video? You can see the sensor behind the bat itself. Can you guys see that?
Manish. Manish, Priyanka, anyone? Yeah. Uh, yes, we can. we can see the image, but not the people. Okay. So the video is not. Yeah. Okay. So okay. So let me just talk. So straight bat is the company which I'm talking about here, and uh, the company is essentially they put that sensor behind the bat, which allows them to track the bat itself and allow the batsman to uh, find out what they're doing right, wrong, or what, how they should play so that they can improve their batting. So that is these are the two applicate two areas which I uh, would like to talk about. With IoT in sports, of course, IoT has gone quite ahead. If you look at the DRS itself, right? Uh, when you are coming for a review, when the when they say, okay, did it pitch in line? Did it pitch out of line? So the ball pitching in on that particular field, right? So there are a lot of sensors which are now getting embedded into the stumps. There are sensors getting embedded into the uh, umpires' uh, uh, cameras. Right? So they can actually capture a lot of information and they are able to deliver uh, how the match is going around, maybe take the fire decision right, or you can look at how you can score more runs or how you can bowl better. So that's how IoT is influencing the sports section. And the Indian companies are, of course, utilizing this to make our sportsmen much better. Not that the the smart ball is something which is new. If you might have heard about the Kookaburra smart ball from Australia, that does something similar. But see how has apparently added a couple of more information by which they are able to predict much better and give you much uh, better information about how the bowling is going on. Okay, so we will now move into what is public cloud doing with IoT, and of course, not just public cloud today with private cloud does a lot with IoT. So initially, IoT was thought of as a hype uh, because nobody really would knew where the data would land or there would be those closed systems which typically would cost a lot for you to take information out and do some processing on top of it. So if you focus on the left side, there is that traffic signal, you have the car, you have your phone, you have your uh, uh, your aircraft or you have your manufacturing system these were initially they were directly talking to the cloud and because the distance from where they were to the cloud was too far the analytics could not be performed in real time and the response could not be delivered in real time uh, so any real time application was not possible so from cloud came the fog so fog is nothing but you are essentially moving the cloud more closer to the user or to the application so the fog, the edge, right? These are the terms you will hear, which essentially means that you are more closer. So if you think about the cloud, the cloud could be something like an AWS or Azure or Google Cloud. Those are the clouds, but the fog itself could belong to any of these guys, or maybe the fog could be located right in the factory where you have something like the Azure stack, which is located right in your factory, or maybe your service provider, maybe a Geo, maybe a Vodafone, maybe a Airtel, any of these guys could actually have the application servers located very close to the end user. So the decision making process is much faster and they can respond much more quickly. Just think about if your data about your car has to travel all the way into the cloud and the cloud is not located, the cloud application is probably not located in your city, it has to travel to another city. The, response time for that will be pretty long. And by that time, probably if you're driving your car and your car was supposed to be taking a certain turn and it didn't take a turn, so you might go into the wrong area or you might hit somebody. Right? So that's essentially the fog part. Now to connect to the cloud, there are various mechanisms which we discussed in the earlier slides. But if you see, that's where you are connecting your the Wi-Fi or the cellular or your satellite, those are the three primary mechanisms which are connected to the cloud, where you are storing your information, you are delivering the intelligence, doing the analytics, everything is being done here. And the sensors are all located here, connecting to Bluetooth, to the gateways, or maybe using near-field communication, maybe using Wi-Fi, Ethernet, or any of those technologies which we talked about. Now, if I'd like to 
if I would break out this into two parts, there are essentially that stage one and stage two, which is the sensors, actuators, which talk to the gateways, which are called as the data acquisition systems. And the other part is the visualization, which is being done in the edge IT, which is the fog area, or maybe further being carried into the cloud for a long-term storage. So this is the four-stage uh, IoT solution architecture, which we're talking about. Essentially, at each point, you could perform some analytics if you want, or maybe perform analytics at a single point. So the information which you're getting from each of these devices would be sent periodically, or it may be sent when the information, uh, I mean, when it has information to send, right? So either it can be streaming or it can be batched. The And then, of course, based on that, your visualization which you're performing is being done at the edge IT, which is the fog area, and further pushed into the cloud for your archiving. Again, further analytics or any management which you want to do. Microsoft Azure uh, has an entire series of uh, applications for IoT, which they have it in their cloud. So right from the things, which is on the left-hand side where you have the edge devices or the IoT devices to performing the insights at the in the cloud or maybe allowing you to take the action. So one is the action could be delivering the business intelligence, maybe those smart reports which you want, the charts, the visualization, or simply the electricity bill, right? So that is your action part here. But the entire information right from the ingestion to the egress can be performed by the cloud itself. So the bulk device provisioning. So when you're connecting, when you're now putting a new sensor out there, how do you know this is a valid sensor? How do you know that a new sensor is available so that you can get data from there? So you need to provision it. And that is done by the IoT DPS, the Azure IoT DPS. So the blue, what you're saying, that is all this names which have been given by the Microsoft platform. Some of these names might have changed as well. So the cloud gateway is called as the IoT hub, which captures the information from the things, delivers it via stream processing to the business layer, or could be doing some transformation. So you might uh, run some function on top of it based on the function, Whatever is the output of the function, you may want to store it, or you may want to deliver it to a machine learning application. And the machine learning can further respond back saying, okay, these are the actions which you can particular, uh, which you can take. The UI reporting and tools, which could be offline, or it could be the Azure reporting tools, which allows you to do the user. Uh, who is the user who can actually use this can be performed by the Azure AD. So this is, of course, a very small slide uh, if you go on to the Azure IoT, which is what I will quickly take you right now, just to showcase what Microsoft has here. So they have a lot, lot of tools out there, right from the IoT Central to the IoT Solution Accelerators to the Edge to the Hub. And you may have heard about the Digital Twin. Uh, just want to check with the audience, have you guys heard about this term called Digital Twin? Yes, yes, we've heard about it. Okay. So the digital training can also be done in the cloud, uh, doing the maps, which is allowing you to do the spatial data. And what Microsoft does is, okay, if you're not sure what tool to use, they have this Q&A session by which you can actually answer, and based on that, they throw the tools which would be right for you. So here is where it asks you, what would you like to do with IoT? Do you want to connect devices? connect and monitor devices remotely. You want to create a digital twin itself. You say next. So how would how will you develop the solution on this the cloud? Uh, maybe you want to start with a SaaS service or build your own, okay? And when you do a show results, it tells you, okay, this is the product which you can typically use. So that is what uh, Microsoft does. Going to the last section of this, uh, we'll talk about the privacy and security of IoT. You may have heard about the IoT attacks. Anybody's heard about Stux Stuxnet? 
Has everybody heard about Stuxnet here? Okay, so I think the answer is no. So Stuxnet was an exploit. Of course, uh, there's a debate which is there that who really created, was it the hackers? What is the crackers they created or was it the governments which used it? So essentially what happened with the Stuxnet bomb was, it went and attacked the Iran nuclear facility and the Iran nuclear facility was totally taken offline and they lost a lot of their turbines. Okay, So now you are launching an attack onto a thing. You're not launching an attack onto an equip on a on your data. You're essentially going and attacking a turbine. And the turbine spin quite fast as a result of which their entire nuclear uh, facility came down. Now, the bad thing what happened with that particular uh, Stuxnet bomb was that it found a way back and some people say that maybe it was the Europeans and the Russians, they figured out what this bomb was and they used this to relay the attack back onto the US and the other parts of the world. So that became an attack which was, which became, which initially was targeted for things, but it turned on the people. Now, you have several such attacks which have happened in the past. Like if you focus on Jan 2015 year at the center, uh, BMW, their servers were imitated by the researchers and based on that, they could actually unlock your car remotely. So which means you owned a BMW vehicle, okay, well, welcome, now I can actually unlock your car. So whatever you have seen in a couple of the movies, right, that was very much possible by using these exploits. Target, which is a American superstore, they had a attack by which uh, the hackers, they essentially looked at the malware, which penetrated to the heating and ventilation part of their uh, superstore. And using that, they actually hacked into Target's servers and stole the data for about 17 million customers. So an attack which was launched via the HVAC was used to steal the customer data. In July of 2015, Jeep, uh, so there's a, there's a news agency called Wired. They showed how a Jeep can be remote controlled by somebody, right? So that is that using that Jeep actually did a recall for about 1.5 million cars. July 2015, you see the sniper rifle, which was shown at the Black Hat conference. Uh, or in March of 2016, this is the one which happened lately. You are looking at the how the hackers uh, how the hackers use the stolen credentials to gain report access to the Ukrainian power grid. And they actually cut down the power for about 225,000 customers. So that tells you that IoT itself is not secure from the attacks because people initially had a mind as who would want to come and attack something like this, you know, who would like to take stuff down. And they thought they were very well protected, but people used either the exploit via the people to attack the things or the things to attack the people, right? So that is what has been happening with the IoT attacks. So it's important that when you're looking at IoT security, you are looking at the four areas and those four areas which you're talking about is securing the device itself, which is the hardware. The second is securing the communication. So what is happening between the device to the gateway and what is happening between the gateway to the cloud that needs to be secured. On the cloud, the cloud itself should be secure. And finally, the lifecycle management. You have to understand that any device out there, it was made at a certain point in time. So it had capabilities which was only available at that particular point of time. And it may not be valid today, just like Y2K, right? In the year 2000, you had computers which were programmed prior to 2000 and nobody thought that, you know, the software would run till the year 2000. So to save on space, they just used those two, last two digits instead of the four digits for the year. And hence we ran into the Y2K problem. Similarly, the devices, they are today having less capabilities. So there is, it's important that the entire life cycle of that 
is created and managed out. So whatever devices as they grow old should get out of the network and the newer devices should be uploaded. So security is something which is pervasive and when you are looking at IoT, don't think that, okay, that's only for the people. It's also for us. On privacy, so I wanted to start with a joke and I'll give you guys a couple of seconds to read this joke. Or maybe your smart weighing machine basically threatening you that, okay, if you don't give me money, I will tweet your weight out to the world. So from a concern perspective, uh, when this survey was done, people told that they were worried about the privacy and the security. These were the two top concerns for people along the world. And if you own any of the devices like the Amazon Echo, I'm just trying to play this video and Manish uh, Prayanka, let me know whether this video plays. Could you hear that video? No, sir. It just hangs up in between and there is no sound. There is no audio. Okay, maybe I am I'm, I'm overestimating the power of PowerPoint here. So maybe I, I think in the real world it works, but unfortunately, I maybe Microsoft Teams, maybe I have to give a feedback to the Teams app that this is not working well. But essentially, what you're seeing here is the Amazon Echo. The Amazon Echo. Uh, Alexa, right? Most of you guys might have seen that ad saying, Alexa, do this for me. Or Alexa, play that music for me, right? The Amazon Echo, uh, if you go and read the entire history since when it has started, there have been a lot of issues which have been reporting around privacy. So this one talks about a woman who uh, was talking at home, okay? And the device is always powered on, so you don't typically shut it off. And the device is actually listening to the conversation happening at home. And this device basically recorded this and delivered that particular piece of information to one of the contacts uh, of that particular woman. Okay. And this was reported to Amazon. And of course, Amazon uh, figured it out, they fixed it. But then a lot of things can go wrong. Right. So this was one of the issues where, uh, which hit the privacy and people felt that, okay, this is where, you know, the challenges are coming up. So there is nothing like a mute button and something which Google did right and something which Amazon didn't do right. So then they came out with the button so that you can now mute your conversation in the second generation. So now you can actually press the button and then it doesn't record. And of course, we are still assuming that it doesn't record uh, because a couple of people proved that even after that particular button, you still have got capabilities which are beyond. So it depends on how the particular device has been made. So especially when you are looking at a commercial application, it's better to go and figure out what are the possible loopholes. Look at the cloud platform where this is talking. Of course, if you're relying on a service which is made by somebody else, so you have to have some sort of back-to-back -back agreement so that if anything like this gets discovered, you can either fix it, of course, or maybe you can move away from there and do your own. So there are a lot of other companies who create uh, an IoT platform, so Jasper, which companies like Cisco, uh, which uh, Jasper, which was bought up by Cisco, is a platform which enables you to onboard the devices, uh, specifically in the cellular area. Then there are, of course, IoT platforms like ThingWorks, which allows you to customize a lot of stuff. And of course, there are a lot of those Arduino and uh, your uh, other small computers by which you can actually build your own apps. So you might want to look at a complete secure IoT platform to build your particular application rather than just 
relying blindly on a particular application which is going on under the cloud, uh, especially if you are focusing on security and privacy. So people like to have a closed environment as much as possible, but uh, again, to build fast, you need the cloud to accelerate your deployment. So you have to basically walk this fine line between the security and privacy, and of course, what can you really deliver to your particular users? All right, so that concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to take a couple of question answer, uh, questions here. Yeah, this is Hardik here. Uh, if you could please explain the shopper stop scenario earlier, which you explained in the retail like no, area. Okay. Uh, now the shopper stop is not a full true example of IoT. It's more of augmented reality. But uh, essentially, what they are also doing is with the newer smart clothes which are coming up. Uh, they are trying to create a truly personalized experience for. A user not just in the store, but they are what what they are also looking at is delivering this on the uh, in the virtual world. So that is what they are essentially looking at. I don't have more information beyond that. Okay, thanks. And the next is uh, what is digital twins? I'm not aware on 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 same. Okay. So what is happening is uh, in the digital twins, uh, if you look at the furnaces, you look at the factory environments. What you are doing is you are trying to create a replica of what is there in the physical world inside your application. So if there is a factory and the factory uses, let's say, coal uh, and it burns at a certain rate, now to control that rate of coal burning or doing anything, it's currently being done manually. Okay, I mean, there are proprietary systems which are connected to that. Now, taking that to internet, these companies are not very much convinced that will it work right? So what they're doing is they are creating a virtual equivalent of that physical thing and showing how it really operates. And they are able to show that how it really works in the physical world. That both are like a mirror of each other. Hence, they are called as twins. So the digital twin is what is there in the virtual world. Okay, thanks. Hi, can you guide more on uh, fintech related uh, IOTs that's happening right now and uh, expanding? So, uh, okay, so right now on the fintech, what is happening is there is a mass movement on seeing how the credit card industry can be revolutionized because today the credit card and debit card, they are actual physical cards and you are essentially paying companies like Visa and MasterCard, which are the intermediaries for those. They're trying to come out with a nap. When they are moving away, they're trying to make your phones, they're trying to make your uh, devices pay for you versus actually carrying the uh, card which was there, which would be swiped against a machine or maybe even uh, touched against a machine or maybe just flashed against a machine, right? So they want to look at mechanisms which can be used alternatively apart from this from a payment perspective and also on the retail side, right? You are looking at a total cashless uh, system by which you, when you are walking in a particular store, the example what you saw for the Amazon Go, you are essentially walking into the uh, store. You are you are just swiping today. Today they are still using the swipe of your uh, maybe a wallet or your uh, whatever card or maybe your phone across the entrance point, which allows you to get inside the store. And when you walk out of the store, it automatically finds, okay, you've moved out of the store, now it's time to bill you, okay? So it is actually capturing your movement across the store, what you have picked up, what is there in your basket, and allowing you to build that particular thing. So that those are a couple of areas which are happening. IoT alone is not working here. There is uh, integration with blockchain. Uh, so Fussel, uh, not Fussel, uh, there is... Uh, there are a couple of these fintech guys who are using the blockchain to capture the entire history as well as they're ca capturing the entire transaction. So when it is happening with the thing, so which thing did that when it is coupled with blockchain? That is how they are delivering the 
entire solution. Okay. Can you explain this point more? Yes. The blockchain integration with things. I'm not able to understand in detail. Uh, actually, the the session is more on IoT. While I've talked. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Blockchain. So maybe you can uh, post the question and maybe I can answer it later on. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Any more questions? So uh, this is Swapna. I have one question. Um, is it? Uh, can you uh, help us understand how IoT can address um, uh, fraud mitigation or prevention in the uh, retail card finance industry? Okay, fraud mitigation and prevention. Uh, so prevention or prediction of fraud um, along those uh, lines with respect to the retail card finance. I haven't experienced that, so I may not be the correct person to answer. Thank you, sir. Irene. So the most of the applications which you're seeing right now uh, are being driven by the automotive industry, the manufacturing, the finance guys are now discovering the use cases. So you talked about fraud mitigation. I'm not really sure about how IoT could be used there. I'm sure there is a there is a use case there, but uh, majority of them are around automotive right now, which is primarily on the predictive maintenance. That is the number one, and uh, the other is around the logistics of uh, the maybe in the in the courier industry or maybe in the transportation industry itself. Those are the most uh, commonly used at this moment. Healthcare is another area where a lot of this is being utilized. So IoT utilization in healthcare is quite a lot. Uh, there is a company called Clever Space. I don't know if you've heard about this. What they essentially do is they use the BLE, which is a Bluetooth low energy devices to do the employee tracking. So if you're working in a uh, factory environment or if you're working in an environment where safety and security is paramount, and if there is something which goes wrong, let's say there's a fire, or uh, so if you work with the organization, you might have gone to a, on a fire drill, right? And it's very manual process in India and in many of the countries today. So using the blue BLE coupled with your uh, coupled with your smartphone, they have developed an application by which they can signal that there is some emergency which has happened and you should come out, and they can track how many people reported on that particular day and how many people have are have really gone out is there somebody left behind that is what they are focusing on they are also focusing on space management so when you are looking at uh, people of occupies occupying spaces in office is there some space which is available so that when you are entering the office most of the offices today are not made one is to one which means that if there are about 1,000 employees, no, they won't have chairs for 1,000 employees. They're like typically building for 700 employees or maybe even 500. Because they assume people will either be on the field, they may be working from somewhere else, maybe traveling, or they are working out from home. Given that scenario, if you are entering your office, is there a conference room available? Is there a chair available for me to work, right? So they are answering some of those questions. They are answering questions around parking management. So when you are getting your car, where can I find the nearest parking spot? Okay, company. I mean, countries like Singapore have integrated this into their own system. Of course, it was prior to the IoT coming up. They already had the system by which, if you entered the city area, it would tell you that there are about so many parkings available. And as you go further, it will tell you that in these public parking areas, there are so many. So you would typically choose the building which is the most closest to your work area. So those are some of the most uh, commonly deployed applications. Uh, smart cities is picking up in India right now. So smart cities uh, initially started as giving public Wi-Fi. So that was the smartness which they talked about. Right now they're talking about Sorry, could I it. interrupt you for a moment, please? Sorry. Could I interrupt you? Could, I, could you please yeah, repeat yeah, please. the company which is uh, dealing with these solutions, parking management, Space utilization, space optimization. What's the There's name the of the company in India? That Clever Space. Clever Spaces. Okay. Okay. 
it's a bombay based company yeah it's a mumbai based company thank you thank you thank you so any more questions uh, uh hi umang the side uh, is there any tools or uh, so systems which we can use to just experiment or uh, more play around the iot uh, any tools that you would like to recommend that if you want to explore further you can use this like that okay. or as test so one is obviously the device itself right so there is a lot of right. available right now there are cheaper platforms like raspberry pis There's the Arduino, and there are many of these uh, microcontrollers which are available for very less cost. Uh, now you could invest in that, but if you're a startup or if you're planning to do a startup, uh, you could join the NASCOM COE, the NASCOM Center of Excellence, where you can actually up it. Right now it is in Bangalore. Uh, I can pass on the link via any shop here to you guys. They allow you to experiment with VR uh, devices. They allow you to experiment with cloud, uh, and of course, if you're a startup, you can also go to any of the cloud vendors. Most of them are very happy to onboard you, allow you to play with their IoT services for a limited or maybe an extended period of time, depending on what level of startup you are. So it depends on what you are planning to do. So if you're planning to do with devices, uh, I would I would recommend please go and at the minimum buy a Raspberry Pi. Buy that sensor kit, which is available from uh, uh, many of these vendors. So there are vendors who have got a pack of so many sensors which are available. There are a lot of projects which are available on GitHub, which you could look at and start working on it. So you don't really need to connect it to the cloud. You could actually experiment with your own laptop or uh, desktop and see it locally how it is working. There are. Oh, sorry, I'm missing the brand names you're seeing. Like. Uh... Oh. So Raspberry Raspberry Pi is not a brand as such. I mean, it's like uh, one of the most common. Yeah, it's a Raspberry Pi is a small computer. It is a thirty-five dollar computer, uh, oh. which do, doesn't have any display, doesn't have any keyboard, doesn't have any mouse. So it's a small piece of equipment. It's like a, uh, I think it is like three by three inches by two inches. That is how small it is. Okay. Okay, and I think the India price is around maybe three thousand five hundred or four thousand rupees. That's That, that's how much it costs. Maybe it is lesser. I have not checked the latest price, but that would be one of the devices which I would recommend. There are a lot of controllers which you can buy from Arduino or uh, from whom? Sorry, A R D U I O A R D U I N O Arduino. Oh, Arduino. Okay. Okay. So these are available on Amazon itself. You don't have to really go to that particular brand as such. There are a lot of these sensors which are available. Sunfire has got about uh, some. There's a pack of about 60 odd sensors which are available. Uh, the pricing varies again. Each of them has got their own pros and cons. But uh, typically, it depends on what area you're planning to play around. So most of the people when they start building their IoT, they typically have a Temperature sensor. They are looking at a humidity sensor. They are looking at a motion sensor. These are the bare minimum sensors. You are looking at a breadboard, which is you don't have to buy it from. I mean, you can go on to whichever is your IT hub in your city. You can find out a breadboard. You can find some jumper wires and connect connect your uh, sensors to your uh, computer, which is your Raspberry Pi, and that computer itself. on that computer you are loading the linux or you can even load uh, windows which is available for the raspberry pi and utilizing that you can connect onto the cloud or maybe to your local computer where you could load the analytics software uh, or you could use the cloud to do it for you i would rather recommend use the cloud because initially it doesn't cost you you can experiment with a lot of these uh, iot products and you can see how it is working if you own a google home or if you own the amazon echo that also is good enough for you to start with your iot projects okay thank you very much yeah thanks any more questions yeah, so you know uh, manish this here the site you know there is one question actually it's a follow up on the earlier question Uh, can we have a session 
you know a technical demo session of any of the devices you mentioned like you know raspberry pi or something because i have used raspberry pi probably a couple of years back and mm -hmm. it was a group of friends that we used it and you know the friends got dispersed so i'm completely out of touch now but you know i would like if you can uh, conduct a technical uh, session on how to connect these devices probably to a laptop or to a cloud and get the data and fetch the data probably a simple uh, demo you know in your follow up session somewhere that would okay. be really good yeah right. i recommend we'll take that as an input okay thank you thank you Any more questions? Um, could you also please elaborate a little bit more on what kind of tools does Microsoft Azure provide for the development of IoT product uh, projects? I mean, okay, so uh, Microsoft uh, Azure has got its own SDK. In fact, they've got an IoT based SDK which you can probably download. Uh, that's what they recommend. Uh, I will find a URL of their IoT, IoT training program where they show you what is the SDK you need to download, what is the Arduino, you, okay. Arduino software you can download, how you can connect to the Azure hub, and how you can play around with maybe a simple solution, a simple solution where basically it uh, keeps on sending the information so that sensor is like coming up over the, it's, it's like, uh, it might seem a little too trivial, but that particular uh, solution which they had, of course, I have it like uh, I'd seen it many years ago. But it was essentially demonstrating that how you can turn on and turn off an LED on your local uh, uh, lab by connecting it to the cloud. So on the cloud, you push the program, and that particular program has got uh, the on and off sequence going on. So it basically lights your LED. So that's basically telling you how to control your home automation using the Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Prinka, uh, are you noting down the questions for me, please? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, time for some last questions. Uh, we have another five minutes to go. Any more questions? All right, so if we don't have any more questions, thanks for your time, friends, and uh, request you to give your feedback to Priyanka, and Priyanka, maybe you want to say something? Yeah, yes, Yogesha. Uh, thanks, Yogesha. It's our pleasure to have you as a speaker and also thanks everyone for joining our webinar. So here, uh, so this is the third webinar from the 360 degree live webinar series. Uh, we are conducting this webinar under the emerging technology uh, community. So alone we can do so little, together we can do uh, much bigger. So this is our, um, this is the famous quote we heard from Helen. So uh, about this community, I'll just uh, give you some small brief. Uh, this when we started this community, we have a uh, 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 little uh, uh, participants in this community. But uh, now we are growing day by day this community. And under this community, we are organizing some great meetup events. And uh, we have recently launched this 360 degree live webinar series. So if you want to get updated about our meetup webinars and events, just follow our meetup community on the meetup. So thanks everyone. Our next webinar is on uh, is in next month. We will also update you about this webinar through our mail. And if you want recordings from this uh, yoga search webinar, just follow our YouTube channel, Synergetics Learning and Consulting, from YouTube. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Yogesh and Priyanka. Thank you, Thank you Yogesh and Priyanka. Thanks, Thank sir. You, uh, could, I, could you just repeat the name of the YouTube channel? It is Synergetics, you said. Yes, uh, it's uh, Synergetics Learning and Consulting, Cloud Consulting. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you.
sometimes you just think about it it's it may look so simple so easy to get about 30 people on there there is a conference everybody it's a technical session this is just an introductory session actually good there nice okay